I am going to be solving Biology 9700, Paper 1, Variant 2, February, March 2017, Multiple Choice. The diagram shows the ultrastructure of a typical animal cell, which structure synthesizes and transports lipids. So, let's look at the options. A is showing a lysosome, I presume. B is showing rough endoplasmic reticulum, which is uh, which does not synthesize lipid. It synthesizes proteins. So B is also not the correct option. C is a smooth endoplasmic reticulum, and smooth endoplasmic reticulum does synthesizes lipids. C might be the right answer. D is mitochondria. That means C is our correct option. Moving on. A light microscope is used to observe two structures that are 200 nanometer apart. How far apart are these structures when the magnification is changed from 40 to 400? So always remember that resolution, which is this. Resolution is not dependent on magnification. Changing the magnification won't have any effect on the resolution. So our answer would remain 200 nanometer, which is option C. Has no effect on resolution. Moving on to question number three. The diagram shows a stage micrometer, a scale viewed through an eyepiece containing a graticule. The small divisions of the stage micrometer are 0 0.1 millimeter. Okay. The stage micrometer scale is replaced by a slide of a plant cell. What is the length of the nucleus in the plant cell? Okay, so for this question, when you, what you need to do first is read this scale. Remember that this is eyepiece reticule, and this is our stage micrometer. Right, so let's first identify the nucleus in the cell, which is this right here. So let's read its I would say it's some, somewhat 10. Okay, so for this, I need to look at this part. Let's say, according to the question, the stage micrometer, this portion of stage micrometer is equal to 0 0.1 millimeter. How many... Uh, 10, 20, 30, 40. So, 40 IP is vertical. You can just write EPG as a short form for IP is vertical. 40 IP is vertical represent 0 0.1 millimeters. So, how much these 10 IP is vertical will represent? So this would become ten into zero point one over forty. This gives us an answer. Over one over forty millimeter. Since the unit is millimeter. Now this is zero point zero two five millimeter. Now, there are no millimeters. This is a different answer, meaning we need to convert the 0.05 millimeter into micrometer to check the answer. For that, we are going to multiply by 1,000, and this would give us an answer of 25 micrometer.
and hence our correct option is C. Moving on. Some features of cells are listed. Cytoplasm, cell surface membrane, ribosomes, which features are found in both animal and prokaryotic cells. So cytoplasm is found in both these type of cells. Cell surface membrane is also found in these cells. Ribosome is also found. 70S in prokaryotic and 80S in animal cells with 70s so the correct option would be a if you get confused in these type of questions you need to memorize this stuff okay so which size of ribosomes is found in chloroplast so we know that chloroplast and mitochondria has ribosomes and they have 70 as ribosomes in which of these organelles is ATP synthesized uh, this is also something that you should be having memorized that chloroplasts and mitochondrion synthesize ATP. They are the only organelles that synthesize ATP. So D is the option. Question 7. A sample of milk is tested with Benedict solution. After boiling, a yellow color is observed. Which conclusion is correct? A high concentration of glucose is present. This is wrong. Then it would give a more darker color, more uh, near to a, a red color. Or a, to be more specific, a brick red color. A low concentration of sucrose is present. It's unclear. It's a vague option. No reducing sugars are present. That's not true because if no none of the reducing sugars were present, there would have been no color change. But there has been a color change from blue to yellow. So this means reducing sugars are present. The table shows some information about carbohydrate polymers, which row describes amylose. So does amylose contain uh, one for glycosidic bonds? Yes, it does. Does amylose has one six glycosidic bond? No, it does not have one six glycosidic bond. Amylopectin has, but not amylose. What, what is the shape of the molecule? We all know that is it is helical. So B. Which row about alpha glucose and beta glucose molecule is correct? Carbon atom on which OH position is different? It's first carbon atom. In alpha glucose, the OH is down the plane on first carbon atom while in beta glucose it is above the plane meaning if this is carbon atom in alpha glucose it is below in beta uh, hydroxyl is above okay cellulose contains both molecules that's wrong no because uh, cellulose only is composed of beta glucose, not alpha glucose. Some of the molecules found in animal tissues are grouped into three lists, which the uh, lists include one or more molecules that always contain nitrogen atoms. So glucose does not have nitrogen atoms. Cholesterol also doesn't have nitrogen. Triglycerides does not have nitrogen. Water, no. So that means list one is cancelled because there's none of the tissues that contain nitrogen atoms. Glycogen, again, does not have nitrogen atoms. Antibodies mm, do have, because antibodies are made up of proteins, and proteins do have nitrogen atoms in them. Adenine, since adenine is a nitrogen base, so it will be having nitrogen. Phospholipids, nope. Hemoglobin, yes. Carbon dioxide, no. mRNA, yes. Monosaccharides, no. So that means our answer is list 2 and 3, which is option D. Hemoglobin consists of two alpha chains and two beta chains. Approximately 5% of all humans have one amino acid in the beta chain that has been changed, affecting the structure and stability of hemoglobin. Which of the levels of protein structure could be changed in the hemoglobin of these humans? Okay, so they're talking about levels of protein that are going to be changed with the changing of one amino acid. Definitely primary will be changed and consequently all the other levels will also be changed, meaning C is the right option. 
because if you change one amino acid, the sequence of amino acids will be changed and thus primary structure will change. And when primary structure changes, the interactions between the uh, R groups of the amino acid changes, meaning secondary, secondary structure and tertiary interactions bonds will be changed. So basically, if there's a change in primary structure, there will be a change in all the other levels of structures. Which row gives the correct description of a collagen molecule and a collagen fiber? So you need to clearly know the difference between a collagen molecule and collagen fiber. So let's read the options. Collagen molecule, alpha and beta polypeptide chains forming a double helix held together by its disulfide bonds. There are many wrong stuff written in this statement. There are no alpha beta polypeptide chains. Uh, they do not form double helix, they form a triple helix. Polypeptides in collagen molecule form a triple helix, not a double helix. Held together by disulfide bonds, um, we have studied covalent bonds, but not uh, specifically disulfide bonds. So this is a very wrong statement. What about collagen fiber? Molecules of collagen arranged randomly to each other linked by hydrogen bonds. Now. Molecules of collagen are not arranged randomly, they are arranged parallel to each other. So that word randomly is very wrongly used here. They are parallel. So it's not so wrong. B, a polypeptide chain with repeating amino acids forming an alpha helix. Again, alpha helix, it's wrong. There's a triple helix formed and there, is, there are three polypeptide chain. It's only one written here, so that's wrong. And only the third amino acid is repeated, which is glycine. Uh, for collagen fiber, three molecules of collagen forming a triple helix held together by hydrogen bonds. Again, it's not necessary. There are three molecules of collagen. And a triple helix is formed in molecule, not fiber. So, nope. Option C, a polypeptide chain with three repeating amino acids forming a helix. Again, triple helix. They have just written helix. And not three repeating amino acids, but the third amino acid is repeated. So, no. Three alpha hel helical collagen molecules forming a triple helix held together by ionic bonds. That's wrong. Not ionic. And definitely, there's nothing as alpha helical here and it is not necessary that three collagen molecules form collagen fiber many can so no option d three helical polypeptide chains three polypeptide chains that's very true forming a triple helix that's very true held together by hydrogen bonds that's again what it is collagen fiber molecules of collagen lying parallel and crossed link to each other cross link so make sure that you pay attention to the keywords which are three polypeptide chains forming a triple helix held together by hydrogen bonds and for collagen fiber molecules of collagen lying parallel and cross linked to each other so d is the right option question 13 the diagrams show the structure of two amino acids each of which has two amine groups a polypeptide sorry not polypeptide a peptide bond is formed between the two amino acids which groups could form the peptide bond so peptide bond is formed between the amine group and the carboxylic group of adjacent amino acids so let's see this and this can form a peptide bond but there is no option given as two and four so let's look at one and five can form a bond. This is the amine group of one amino acid. This is the carboxylic group of the other amino acid. They can form peptide bond, which is a covalent bond. And it looks somewhat like this. It is formed in a condensation reaction with the removal of one water molecule. And our answer would be B. An enzyme was added to a small excess of its substrate, a small excess. All variables were kept constant. A student was asked to sketch a graph to show how the concentration of enzyme substrate complex changes over time. Which graph shows this correctly? Okay, so according to this information given, the graph would be starting off high and then decreasing to zero. So you need to 
pay attention to these two points starting of i These are the wrong graphs that you cancel out at first sight because the enzyme substrate concentration won't, would not increase. And in graph C, the concentration is just constant, so that's not the case because eventually product will be formed. So the concentration of enzyme substrate complex will be decreasing over time and becoming zero when all the product will be formed. So the most suitable answer is D. The table contains results recorded by a student from an investigation into the effect of the temperature on a enzyme catalyzed reaction. All other variables were standardized. What is the correct conclusion? 40 degrees was the optimum temperature. Let's look at this. At 40 degrees, the rate of reaction is highest. Okay. The data for 50 degrees Celsius was anomalous. Uh, I don't think it is anomalous. If it would have been weirdly different value, then it would have been anomalous. The optimum temperature was between 30 degrees and 50 degrees Celsius. Um, okay, the optimum temperature was between 40 degrees Celsius and 50 degrees Celsius. Option C seems to be the most suitable answer because you need to take note that the readings are taken every 10 degrees Celsius of temperatures, right? So the optimum temperature at which the rate is the highest could be in between these. So it's better to take a bigger range that is given in the question because we do not know for exact when the optimum temperature is. So it might not be fit to just say that 40 degrees is the optimum temperature. So we need to take this whole area because the activity is highest at these range of temperature. So C is the best option. What is the correct range of measurements for the width of the cell surface membrane? So remember that the average size of cell surface membrane is seven nanometers. So it should be around this answer. This is the closest, so B. The cells in the roots of beetroot plants contain a red pigment. When pieces of root tissue are soaked in cold water, some of the red pigment leaks out of the cells into the water. An experiment was carried out to investigate the effect of temperature on the loss of red pigment from the root cells. It was found that the higher the temperature of the water, the higher the rate of loss of red pigment from the root cells. Which of these statements could explain this trend? Enzymes in these cells denature as the temperature increases, so the pigment can no longer be used for reactions inside the cells and diffuses out. As the surface, sorry, as the temperature increases, the tertiary structure of protein molecules in the cell surface membrane changes, increases the increasing the permeability of the membrane. Phospholipid molecules gain kinetic energy as temperature rises, increasing the fluidity of phospholipid bilayer and allowing pigment molecules to diffuse out more easily. So one thing for sure is that the higher the temperatures, the more the structure of the phospholipids and proteins in the cell surface membrane would change, resulting in increasing loss of pigment through the membrane, right? So that's something that we are sure of. So two and three are right. About one, it's a very specific statement and we do not know we do not know for exact how much the temperature is being high being increased that the enzymes will get denatured because around more than 40 degrees Celsius the enzymes might denature and we do not even know what type of enzymes they are so this statement is very vague and cannot be it needs more evidence to be correct so we are not going to consider it and so two and three are the only options The cell surface membrane structure is described as fluid mosaic. Which statement describes the, mo the mosaic part of the cell surface membrane? So that would be the specific pattern of proteins at the phospholipid bilayer, which is option D. The different patterns that are obtained by moving phospholipid molecules? No. 
the random distribution of cholesterol molecules within the phospholipid bilayer? No. The regular pattern produced by phospholipid heads and prote membrane proteins? No. It's the scattering. Scattering is the keyword of what? Of the different proteins that are within the phospholipid bilayer. So scattering and proteins are the keywords. The diagram shows two pathways, X and Y, through which uh, molecules can diffuse across a cell surface membrane, which row correctly shows possible pathways for lipids, water, and glucose. So for lipid, is, it is going to be only X because lipids are, they can pass through bilayer, they can pass through the hydrophobic core of the bilayer, while glucose cannot pass through uh, the hydrophobic core and it can only pass through a channel protein through facilitated diffusion so why only okay water it is small enough to pass through the bilayer but it, no, it is not as efficient as gases like oxygen and carbon dioxide because of its polarity so it does pass through x and it is also passing through y so it's a some stem cells divide and give rise to phagocytes where in the human body do these stem cells divide definitely bone marrow not in blood not in lymph nodes so it's C what is the correct sequence of stages in the mitotic cell cycle it is G1 then S phase where the DNA replication is done G2 growth second growth phase mitosis cytokinesis so C memorize this the enzyme telomerase repairs telomeres. It stops the telomeres from getting shorter each time a chromosome is replicated. Telomerase is not normally active in human body cells, but in some diseases, telomerase can be activated. In which disease is the enzyme telomerase activated? Definitely cancer. Whenever you see enzyme telomerase activity, know that it is related to cancer because can in cancer, there is uncontrolled uh, replication, uncontrolled And what is going to aid in this uncontrolled replication? Telomeres are important. If there are no telomeres, there would not be any replication. And hence, telomerase enzyme is required so that telomeres could be uh, elongated for replication. These statements describe events during the mitotic cell cycle. What is the correct order of three of these events in the mitotic cell cycle? Okay, so chromosomes migrate to opposite poles of spindle. That's anaphase. Chromosomes arrange themselves at the equator, that's metaphase. Chromosomes condense and the nuclear envelope disappears, that's prophase. Chromos not chromosomes, centromeres divide. Okay, so that could be a part of anaphase. So let's set, check. A is 2, then 3, then 4. So 2, then 3, nope, that's right of the bat wrong because Prophase is coming after metaphase, that's not true. B, 3, 2, and then 4. 3, prophase, okay. 2, metaphase, and then 4, anaphase. That could be our answer. C, 3, 4, 2, prophase, anaphase, no, that's wrong. Directly anaphase, D, 4, 2, 1, anaphase, 2, metaphase, no. So B is our answer. You can write the terms to make it easier for you. Which statement about nitrogenous bases is correct? Adenine is a pyrimidine with a double ring structure. No, adenine is not a pyrimidine. It's a purine. And yes, with a double ring structure. So this is wrong. Cytosine is a purine with a double ring structure. No, cytosine is a pyrimidine with a single ring structure. So that's completely wrong. Guanine is a purine with a single ring structure. Nope, with a double ring structure. Uracil is a pyrimidine with a single ring structure. That's true. So adenine and guanine are purines with a double ring structure. And cytosine, thymine, and uracil are pyrimidines with single ring structure. Moving on, Repa refampicin 
is a antibiotic used to treat tuberculosis. It works by inhibiting RNA polymerase in bacteria. Which of these processes will be directly inhibited by this antibiotic? ATB synthesis, no. RNA polymerase is involved in the process of transcription, so yes, it would be directly inhibited. Translation, no. Because RNA polymerase is not directly involved in translation, it is involved in transcription after which translation happens. So it's not directly involved. So see the answer. Messelson and Stahl investigated DNA in bacteria. They grew bacteria in a medium with only heavy nitrogen until all of the bacterial DNA contained only heavy nitrogen. These bacteria were then moved from the heavy nitrogen medium and cultured in a medium with only light nitrogen. Okay. Some bacteria were collected from each of the next three generations and their DNA was analyzed. Hybrid DNA contains both heavy and light nitrogen, which row shows the correct DNA of the first and third generations. Okay, this is something that you should know that in the first generation, the DNA would be all hybrid, meaning it would be something like this. 15... In the first generation, it would be like this, but in the third, what is going to happen is only one in four is going to be a hybrid, and all the other three are going to be light. This is the third. So according to this, let's look at the options. All hybrid, that's right. And in the third generation, half hybrid, half light, no. All hybrid, one quarter hybrid, three quarters light, this is correct. Half hybrid, half heavy, no. Half hybrid, one quarter heavy, one quarter light, no. So the correct option is B. The diagram shows the stages in the production of part of a polypeptide, okay, which feature of the triplet code is illustrated by the information given. An amino acid can be coded for by more than one triplet. See here, this is the same amino acid, and it is coming from different triplet code, different codons. So this first option is correct. The triplet code is non-overlapping and is only read in one direction. The triplet code is non-overlapping, that is true. It basically means that each nucleotide is a part of only one codon, me meaning that a single nucleotide cannot be part of two adjacent codons, that's true. The problem with this option is that there is no uh, evidence that this information is showing that. In option A, it was clearly visible by the same amino acid that it could be coded for by more than one triplet. So option A is much more nearer than option B. The triplet code is universal for the DNA of all organisms. That's definitely not what we can infer from this information. There are some triplets that code for start and stop. That's also wrong. And it's actually nowhere written here that a specific codon is a start or stop uh, triplet. So, very vague. So, the nearest option, A. Which combination of features is characteristic of a phloem sieve tube element as it unloads into a sink? So, water potential should be higher than sink because then only water will, uh, will uh, move to the areas with lower potential. So that means the sink must have a higher water potential. That means the water will uh, transport itself to the areas where the water potential is lower. So higher. That means that if this is phloem to phloem, then these are the 
sink cells. So the water potential here should be high and then it would be transported to this. Because water travels from a higher gradient to low. It basically travels down the gradient. Lignification of the servo? No, there's no lignification. So that water can easily enter from these thin cell walls. Lignification is in xylem, not in phloem. Which statements correctly describe transport pathways in dicotyledonous plants? In this simplest pathway, water may move through intracellular spaces. The simplest pathway may be blocked by the tonoplast. In the opoplast pathway, water does not move through plasmodes matter. The opoplast pathway may be blocked by the Casparian strip. So one is wrong because simplest pathway is not water moving through intracellular spaces. It's water moving through cytoplasm or from vacuole to vacuole. And no, water is not uh, blocked by the tonoplast. In oboplast pathway, water does not move through the plasma does matter. That's true because in simplest pathway, water travels through the plasma does matter, but not in opoplast because opoplast pathway is from cell wall to cell wall. Opoplast pathway may be blocked by the Casparian strip. That's true. Casparian strip is basically water impermeable ceiling that forces the water to enter endothermal cells. So that's true for opoplast pathway. The diagram shows transverse sections of parts of a plant which labeled structures transport mineral ions. So let's label first. One is xylem, two is phloem, three is xylem, and four is phloem. Okay, so mineral ions are transported via xylem. So A should be the answer. Um, they are transported, dissolved in water through xylem because they're absorbed from soil. So hence they will be transported from xylem. Make sure that you know this. Which feature of transport in plants is correct for both xylem and phloem? It is passive, it occurs by mass flow, it occurs from source to sink, it occurs only in one direction. Remember that water and mineral ions move up xylem vessels by mass flow and uh, mass flow also occurs as a result of hydrostatic pressure differences between source and sink which happens in phloem. So mass flow happens both in both of them. So definitely B is the answer. A basically means just diffusion is taking place. So no, it's not true. Because uh, loading in phloem uh, needs uh, ATP. So, and osmosis is also happening. So A is not the correct option. Uh, source to sing, that's not always true because item is in the opposite direction to phloem. It occurs only in one direction. Phloem sap can move in different directions. What is the main function of a companion cell in phloem tissue? Providing cytoplasmic contact with the sieve tube element for loading. Providing structural support for the sieve tube element. That's wrong. Providing the nucleus for cell division in the phloem. No. Providing uh, the source of assimilates for storage. No. Cytoplasmic contact basically means plasma does matter. So it provides cytoplasm through which a loading can happen in the form of plasma does matter. The contraction of the heart is coordinated through electrical impulses passing through the cardiac muscle. What is the right order of part of the sequence of these impulses? So sinoitral node, right and left arteria, per kind tissues, arteroventricular node. At first glance, anyone would think that's the right option, but no, it's not. These two are right, but these two should be inter-exchanged. So D is not right. Right and left atria, sinoitral node, it, arteria, ventricular node, ventricular walls. Again, these two should be inter-exchanged. Right and left arteria, per kind tissue, ventricular walls, arteria, ventricular node, definitely wrong. Right and left arteria, AVN or arteroventricular node, per kind tissues, ventricular, ventricular walls. That seems to be right. 
So basically what happens is sinoatrial node, which is present or located in the right side, right atrium of the heart, uh, it actually initiates the impulses, which makes both the atria contract and the AVN, which is the arterioventicular node, that delays the impulse by 0.1 second and then passes the electrical impulse to perkine tissues and from perkine tissues they go to bundle of his and from bundle of his they go to the apex of the heart, which is the lowest point of the heart and from there the ventricular walls start to contract after a delay of 0.1 second. So this is the whole detailed cycle but you only need to know a few terms including the perkine tissues, arteriventricular node, ventricular walls, and you should know the delay. As blood flows from an artery to a vein, the thickness, the thickness of the walls of the vessels changes. Which bar chart shows these changes correctly? One thing you should be sure of whenever you look at the thickness of the walls of different blood vessels that capillary will be having the least thickness because it is it has a wall which is only one cell thick and all of these a, B, and C, the capillary is not the least thick. So these are all wrong. At the first glance, you should be able to tell. In part D, in option D, the least thick wall, which is the capillary shown, so that means D is our answer. And you can tell that artery is having a more uh, thick wall than, ven uh, than vein because we know that in artery, the pressure is more of the blood than in vein. So it's a very easy question. The key is also given to you, but just by one uh, hint of capillary, you would be able to solve it in a second. The graph shows the oxy oxygen dissociation curves of hemoglobin of two species of mammal, S and T, okay, uh, which statements could explain the difference in the oxygen dissociation curves of species S and species T. Species T has a lower hemoglobin concentration in its red blood cell than species S. So... As you can see, for species T, uh, a more partial pressure of oxygen is required to have the same percentage saturation of hemoglobin. Okay, let's read all the options first. The hemoglobin in species T has a lower affinity for oxygen than the hemoglobin in species S. So that's definitely true because we just said that more partial pressure of oxygen is required to have the same amount of uh, saturation of hemoglobin with oxygen. And at a Partial pressure, particular partial pressure of oxygen, the percentage saturation of hemoglobin for species S is more than percentage saturation of hemoglobin uh, with oxygen in species T. So that's definitely, 2 is definitely right. Species T lives at higher altitudes than species S. That's not really what this would tell us because altitudes would not really have this much effect. Change in altitude only has effect till few days, and then the number of hemoglobin cell, the hemoglobin in and red blood cell increases to compensate for the uh, percentage saturation of oxygen of with hemoglobin, oxygen uh, in hemoglobin. So three is not very right, but one and two are true. And lower concentration of Hb in species T because, as you can see that at a partial pressure of oxygen, the percentage saturation of hemoglobin with oxygen is less, meaning there might be less red blood cells in species T. That's why the percentage saturation is less. So, B. Now, let's look at option B again. I think I misread it. Species T has a lower hemoglobin concentration in its red blood cells than species S. Now, this is a very... No, 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 this should be wrong because lower hemoglobin concentrations for red blood cells that did not really happen. That would have been the case in the, in, in, if there was some sort of disease. But I don't think it can happen just like that. I think two makes the most sense. So, yeah. Which tissues may be found in bronchioles? So, okay. Cartilage, you know, ciliated epithelium, yeah, some glandular tissue, this is wrong, because there's no cartilage. Ciliated epithelium, elastic fibrous mucosal, that's right. 
uh, elastic fibers, hard edge, and hard edge is not there. Smooth muscle gland. So, which of these statements could describe the effect of hardened monoxide and cigarettes? Okay, so this question I'll be skipping because I think this is not a good part of service anymore. Not the as my only job. The glo global mortality figures for some diseases in 2002 are shown in the table. How many millions of people died from viral diseases listed in the table in 2002? How many millions of people? Okay, so you need to know what viral diseases are of these diseases. So HIV is a viral disease. TB is not a viral disease. Malaria is not a viral disease. Uh, measles. So measles is not part of slavery anymore, but we have to consider it for this question, so I'm going to do it. Measles is also caused by the virus. So 2.8 plus 0.6 gives us 3.4. So I'm saying speed. We, do, we just need to add 2.8 plus 0.6 because those are the only viral disease. Which of these statements would describe both B lymphocytes and T lymphocytes? They contain specific protein receptors in their cells of the membranes. They differentiate into plasma cells. They divide by the cells. So this is wrong that they differentiate into plasma cells because only B lymphocytes differentiate into plasma cells. Remember that only B lymphocytes can secrete antibodies when they differentiate into plasma cells. T lymphocytes do not secrete uh, antibodies. So two is wrong. They contain specific protein receptors in their cells of the membranes. Yes. They divide the mitosis. Yes, that's true. So a. Two people, G and H, were given were each given an injection to protect them against a particular pathogen. One person was injected with antibodies and other person was injected with a vaccine. The graph shows the concentrations of the antibody against this pathogen in the blood of two people, G and H, over a period of 20 days following the injection. Okay. Which row correctly describes the type of immunity shown by G and H? So an antibody would give Natural, not natural, artificial passive immunity, while the vaccine gives artificial active immunity. I have this chart that I that makes it easier for me to recognize which type of immunity is being given. So natural, it's not natural. This is active natural is the body's own uh, response when infected with a pathogen. Artificial would be active artificial is for a vaccine. And classic natural is through mother either by placenta or lactation and passive artificial is by antibodies injected. It is with the pie chart, if you memorized it, you would be very easily able to do these sort of questions. So this was it for this paper. I'll see you in the next video.